Thank you all for coming. Let me recap what we did last time. We've started talking about source coding, also known as data compression. We've been looking at toy examples. One example of a redundant file for us to compress is something that's mainly zeros with just a few ones scattered at random. So we call that the bent coin. How should we can compress a file like that? Well, when we're thinking about compression, the claims we're examining are Shannon's assertions that if you take log base two of one over the probability of an outcome, that tells you how much information content that outcome has got. And it's how long the message ought to be associated with that outcome in bits as well. It's the ideal message length. The entropy, which is the average of the Shannon information content, is claimed to be the right way to measure average information content. And the third assertion that we've got and that we have sort of proved last time is the source coding theorem, which says that if you get a very long string of outcomes from uh, a random source identically distributed, then those outcomes can be compressed into roughly n times the entropy bits. So we sort of proved that last time. We uh, did this proof by counting the typical set. We didn't actually do a general proof, that's in the book. But what we did was we looked at a special case of the bent coin, where you toss it n times and get mainly zeros and a few ones. And there we all know what the typical set is. You expect to get roughly, if it was a bent coin with a bias of 10%, you expect 10% ones. And the typical set of strings is all the strings that have roughly 10% ones. So in general, what the typical set means, and this is a, a defined concept, is uh, if you get a string of n independent outcomes from a source, that string is very likely to be in a typical set. The typical set elements all have roughly the same probability as each other, and there are two to the n times the entropy of them. So the rough proof of the source coding theorem is then, well, just give a name to each of these guys, the number of names um, you'll need is 2 to the n times the entropy, so the length of all the names will be n times the entropy. And they've incidentally all got roughly the same probability as each other, which must therefore be 2 to the minus n times the entropy. So that's the uh, very rough outline of the proof of the source coding theorem for a general source. And we did it for the bent coin, um, looking at a long string of n outcomes and the way we found our, ourselves at the proof was we imagined playing the bent coin lottery. We wanted to win the lottery for the mafia boss. How much of his money did we need to spend? Which tickets would we buy? Well, we found this big sack full of tickets and then we imagined writing a, a new name for each ticket on the reverse of the ticket. We counted the number of tickets in the bag and we found we had two to the n times the entropy. So that's what we did last time. That was our proof of the source coding theorem, at least for the bent coin. When I said the number of tickets in the bag is 2 to the n times the entropy, it's 2 to the n, 2 to the n times the entropy plus a little bit. And that little bit is to do with the fluctuations around the, the mean of the, the typical number of, of ones. Those fluctuations go as square root of n, where n is the length of the, the string. So they get relatively small compared to this, the main term, nh2. And here's just a picture reminding you what a Gaussian distribution looks like. And you can get the probability um, down um, as small as you like, the probability of failure as small as you like, just by adding a few extra square root of n's, uh, a few extra standard deviations to your typical set. All right, so that was a ridiculous way to do compression. It involved a very large bin bag full of tickets that you wrote things on the two sides of. That was our compression and uncompression algorithm. Now, for the next two lectures, we're going to discuss practical data compression. How would we compress a bent coin practically? Well, that's actually a homework exercise I set for you, so I'd like you to work on that but we'll carry on working on other approaches to related problems. And I'm going to talk today about a method of doing data compression called symbol codes. And the idea of a symbol code is 
it's something you could apply, for example, to English or to any language that involves an alphabet of characters where some characters are more probable than others. And to make life especially simple to start with, I'm going to pretend that the probability distribution for every character is the same every time and that we know that distribution and we'll usually assume that it's non-uniform. So here is what that distribution could look like. Here's an alphabet of 26 characters plus space, so 27 in all, and a probability distribution over those. And you can see space is the most probable character, and then we've got E, T, A, O, I, N, H, R, S, H, D, L, all that, that sort of stuff. So it's a, this is like an English language distribution. And the task now is to give a code word to each of these symbols in the alphabet, to each, to each of these elements of the alphabet. And here's an example of what those code words could look like. We're going to encode into binary, and we've given A the code word four zeros, and we've given Z the code word one one zero one zero 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 one, and space has got zero one. Uh, so that's an example of a code. And the way you use a symbol code is you take the source file and you replace it by the corresponding code words in order, concatenated with no punctuation at all. So the receiver won't be able to see where the boundaries between the code words are. Okay. So. A symbol code is going to be a map from each symbol X in your alphabet to, we'll call it C of X. And C of X is a binary string. And as you can see here, it can be of, of any length. And the way we write that in set notation is 0, 1 is the set with 0 and 1 in it. And zero, 01 set with a plus means the set of all strings of any length um, made up of zeros and ones. Um, that may be familiar to those of you who hang out with computer scientists. Um, let me give you another example. Zero, 01 to the power 2 is the same as the set of strings 00, zero, zero 01, one, zero, and 11. One, one. Okay, so that's just a little bit of notation. A symbol code is a map from symbols to binary strings, and then the way a symbol code works is we encode a string of outcomes x1, x2, x3, up to xn, by concatenating without punctuation the code word for x1 and the code word for x2, the code word for x3 and the code word xn. So, I'll just give you an example. If we gave A the code word 1, B the code word 0, 1, 0, and C 1, 0, 1, 1, then the file containing CABB would get encoded as 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, Zero, one, zero. Okay, so that's a fairly simple idea, but now we need to get our head around these symbol codes, understand them theoretically, and understand them practically. And these are quite important codes. They're quite widely used, especially in, in history. So the questions we want to ask today are the theoretical question, how well might a symbol code perform? And what we're anticipating here is maybe the answer will have something to do with the entropy and Shannon information content and that sort of thing. And that would, again, reinforce the claims we've been asserting. And then the practical question, is, hey, stuff theory, I just want to know how to make a good one. How do we make good symbol codes? And when we say good or optimal, we need to define what we mean by optimal. 
So let's do that. So, what do we mean by optimal? Well, we're after compression, so we want a short expected length, don't we? So we'll use that as our main objective function. So there may be others. So we'll define the expected length of a code C for an ensemble X, on the ensemble being the alphabet with all its probabilities. We'll define it to be L of C and X is sum over all your elements in your alphabet and multiply the probability of that outcome by the length that you have assigned, where Li is the length in bits of the code that you've assigned to the i element. OK, nothing profound going on here. I'm just defining the expected length. And it's probably a good idea to immediately use an example. So let's give ourselves an alphabet. And the alphabet's going to be A, B, C, D. And let's have a probability distribution. Half, quarter, one eighth, one eighth. So this is a toy probability distribution with uneven probabilities. One thing we might want to know about this ensemble is what is its entropy? And the answer is, well, it's a half times one plus a quarter times two plus an eighth times three plus an eighth times three. These one, two, three, and three being respectively the logs base two of this, 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 and this. And that is one and three quarter bits. So let's um, give ourselves a symbol code and then try and make it better. And we need to pin down what the rules of the game are actually going, going to be here. Um, so what do we want? Uh, let's, let's define the, the rules first and then look at some examples. First rule is it had better work. When someone encodes with this and then someone else decodes, they better get back what we first put in. So what comes out must be what comes in. Um, we want it to decode correctly. And we want it to guarantee to decode correctly, not just to have a 99.9% .9 chance of working, which was already quite good in our, our slightly silly approach of last time. We want it to always decode correctly. Um, so let's just define our other rules, and then I'll say a bit more precisely what we, what we mean by, by this. Ideally, we'd like it to be easy to decode as well. So we don't want to have the recipient having to sp spend hours staring at the code book, trying to figure out where the, punctuation, where the missing punctuation marks go in, the, in this received string. So easy to decode would be nice to have. But it's not essential if, if we can get a big win on this final objective, which is the small expected length. Small L C X. OK, let's just be precise about what we mean by is got to decode right. We want the code to be uniquely decodable. So when you receive an encoded string, there should be no ambiguity about what was sent. So for any string x and any other string y, such that x is not the same as y. We want the encoding of x to not equal the encoding of y. So that's the definition of unique decodability. Uh, 
Okay. And just to check my notation is clear, C of AI is the way we encode a particular element of the alphabet. And then if we have C of a string like X, that's just the concatenation of X1, X2. Okay, so I'm overloading this symbol C to mean either the way that you encode a single symbol or it could be the encoding of an entire string. All right. Okay, we've got ourselves an ensemble. Let's define some symbol codes and have a think about these objectives. What does it mean to say it's got to be uniquely decodable? What does, what does that imply? How do we get a small expected length? Is this a good start for English? Um, could it be made better? Is it uniquely decodable? Let's look at a, a simple example. Let's define a code called C1, and its code words are going to be one and three zeros, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, and three zeros and a one. And I've deliberately made them all four characters long because now we know the recipient will be able to put the punctuation marks in the right place because they're all four characters long. What's the expected length of this? Well, all code words are four bits long, so the expected length is also four. Right, um, can we improve on this? Is this, uh, is this the best possible uh, code for this ensemble? Any suggestions? It's got rather a lot of zeros in it, hasn't it? Should we get rid of some of the zeros? Would that work? Ooh, you're being shy today. Yes. Get rid of the trailing zeros. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. So if we remove all the trailing zeros, then the recipient will still be able to figure out where the punctuation marks ought to be because they can just look for the ones and they know that the one comes at the end of any code word. All right. So this is still still self-punctuating and it's easy to decode because they just read along till they had a one and then they can spit out okay it must have been a c or whatever whatever they have got to so what's the expected length of this well i've worked it out for you in advance it's 1.875 or one and seven eighths okay that's a nice idea um Can we get the expected length any shorter? Uh, how, how, about, how about this one? How about that code? What's the expected length of this one? The expected length is one. Okay. Is it uniquely decodable? Maybe not, because even very short strings may have the same encodings as each other. Okay, so this is not uniquely decodable. Okay, so the goal is to get the expected length very short. Um, oh, so can we do any better than, than this one? Well, uh, how about this? We need to have, have a bit more length. They've got to be a bit, the code words must be different from each other. Okay, that's one of the rules. So a deduction from the rule is all Code words must be different. And that's a consequence of unique decodability. All right, so let's make them different, okay? Uh, how about this? One, zero, 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 one, zero, and one, zero. Okay. The expected length of this is one and five eighths. How do you work out the expected length? Okay, the expected length is there's a chance of a half of this happening, a quarter of this, and an eighth for this, and an eighth for this. So the question was, where does the expected length come from? The expected length is there's a half chance of getting a length of one, there's a quarter chance of a length of two plus a one-eighth chance of three, plus a one-eighth chance of two. 
and then I added those up. All right? So it's just the average length of a word, given that the lengths are going to be the lengths are one, two, three, and two. Okay, any other questions? So what do you think of this guy? Let's, let's use him to encode something. It's, the, it's got a shorter expected length than examples we've looked at so far. Let me encode something with it. C A A B encoded with this code number three, code four. When we encode C A A B, we get O one O one one O. Oh. So is C4 easy to decode? Is it uniquely decodable? What we're trying to do here is sort of sail close to the wind. We want to make all the code words as short as possible because that's good news, but we don't want to sail too close and have problems of unique decodability. So is this uniquely decodable? We could stare hard at this and, and try and figure out, is there some other interpretation? So we read along, uh, zero, one. How could we get zero, one? Oh, it has to be a C, doesn't it? So we sort of think hard and we say, okay, that's a C. Then we look at this bit. And um, one, one, zero. What could be this? So we're thinking hard, looking at the code book, and we say, hmm, well, maybe, Oh, look, there's another zero here. It could be an A and an A, um, and then a B. But it could have been, uh, maybe it was a, an A here, and a one and a zero. Maybe that was a D here, and then there was a zero from somewhere. And so, it's difficult to decode, because I'm not quite sure, especially if we haven't reached the end yet. It's not clear what's going on. Can anyone give us a proof that it's actually not uniquely decodable? A proof would mean that you find two strings that have exactly the same. DC. DC. Okay, so if you encode DC, that gives you 0, 1, 0. Sorry, DC gives you 1, 0. Zero, one, zero, okay? And it, have you got another string that also encodes as? A, B, H. A, B, D is one, zero, zero, one, zero. Well done, okay? So if we call this X and this Y, they're different, but they've got the same encoding. So it's not uniquely decodable, okay? So this is useless, not uniquely decodable. So, what's going on? Let's give ourselves one more example. C5. Here's C5. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Okay, expected length of this is two. Because they're all length two. So that's not as good as this one. Um, actually, I want to give you a few more. Has anyone got any further ideas? Any ways we can improve? Yeah. The, uh, for C2, mm -hmm. you can make the last symbol zero, zero, zero. Aha. So you're suggesting take C2 and tweak the last word. So we'll get C6 using 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. But you're saying you don't actually need that final punctuation character, because once you've seen three zeros, if you're using C2, you know a 1 is coming next. So you can get rid of it. All right? Great. OK, so the lengths are 1, 2, 3, and 3, which incidentally 
are the same as the Shannon information contents. Let's call those HI, one bit, two bits, three bits, and three bits. So the expected length, which is the average of the length, is going to be the same as the average of the Shannon information contents, which is the entropy, which we've already worked out. So that's one and three quarter, which is the entropy. Right, so that's a fun idea. We've got a symbol code whose expected length is the entropy. If we encode C, A, A, B with this, then we get 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. Now, so an interesting thing to notice that this set of code words here has lots of zeros in it and only a few ones. Do you think you can make it any better? Is it uniquely decodable? Can anyone give an argument why it must be uniquely decodable? We've sort of already said it, haven't we? Okay, you're being shy. I'll, I'll help out. The receiver can read along and look in the code, code book and once they reach the end of a valid word that's in the code book, nothing else will have happened. You can't reach, you can't get through an, a different code word on the way to the code word you're actually thinking of. No code word is a prefix of any other code word. So this code, this is a prefix code, is the name we give to this, no code word is a prefix of any other. We don't have to use prefix codes, but it makes them easy to decode. Another property of a prefix code is you can arrange the code words in a tree where the branches in the tree are the decision is the next character going to be a zero or a one, and at each step in the tree, you either keep going or you stop because you found a code word. So in this one, you go down the one branch and you stop and you found the code word for A, which is one. You go this way, you get zero and one, if you have zero followed by one, then you've got B, which is encoded with zero, one, the characters that we, the, the symbols we saw as we went along those branches. We keep going down here, zero and one. This is C, this is D. All right. I'm gonna give you just one more code. Unfortunately, I ran out of board. Let's put it way over here. Let me define another code, C7. It's going to look like this, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. I've deliberately chosen this one because it's not a prefix code. It has the property that the code word for A is a prefix of the code words for B and for C. All right. So it's not a prefix code, which means it may be a bit of a headache to decode. If you receive a one and you know some more stuff is coming and you receive a zero, what, what was going on? Could it be an A, could be we start a D, you get another zero, you still don't know, you get some more zeros. You still don't know what's going on. And you wait and you get lots and lots of zeros and you still don't know. And maybe when a one comes along, then maybe you can figure out whether the first symbol was an A, a B or a C. Okay, so we don't like this because uh, it's not easy to decode, but is it actually uniquely decodable? Yes, why? Okay, so if you reverse these four code words, they are the same as the code words of C6, which is uniquely decodable. 
If this one were not uniquely decodable, that would mean it has got two code words, which are, two, sorry, two strings, x and y, whose encodings are identical to each other. You could then reverse the two of those, and you would have found yourself a pair of strings that have the same code word over here for this code. And we know that's impossible because that one's uniquely decodable. So this one is uniquely decodable, but we don't like it because it's not a prefix code. So this is uniquely decodable. Right, so one of the ideas we're floating now is easy to decode could mean, for example, that we'd like a prefix code, please. But we really do want small expected length. OK. Let me suggest an idea now about how we get small expected length. We've found a code here which we're speculating could be the best you can do for this ensemble with a simple code because it happens to have reached the entropy and we've already heard some theorems about not being able to do better than the entropy. Um, and it has the property, here's the key intuition about simple codes and is of all of data compression, it has the key property, you give short code words to the probable outcomes and longer code words to the less probable ones, okay? That's what it's all about. And that's a possible guess about how we might get the smallest possible expected length. We could say, oh, you give me a, a list of probabilities, I'll sort them, and I'll give the shortest possible code word to the most probable one, and, the, and steadily longer code words as we go down the list. Have a chat to your neighbor and see what you think of, of that idea. Okay, so I've suggested an idea here. It's got the right spirit. It's giving short code words to the probable outcomes and long ones to the less probable ones. Is that going to work, or can anyone criticize that for us? If you've got a huge number of symbols, then what? It might not be good. It's definitely not good. Probably not good. Okay. I might agree with you. <laughs> Let me give you uh, some backup for your intuition there. We found a case where this proposed algorithm is getting us to the entropy, so we can't be too critical of it, but maybe we can find a counterexample where it doesn't, it doesn't work. And it doesn't need to be a monster example. We can give them all a probability of a quarter except just to make life interesting, we'll add epsilon to one of them and add epsilon over two to one and subtract epsilon over two from this one and subtract epsilon from that one, where epsilon is a billionth, okay? So they're all essentially, they all have a probability of a quarter. All right, and now we apply this suggested algorithm and what code do we end up with? We end up with C6, all right? So this is a, a new probability distribution. When you use code six, which is proposed by this algorithm here, you get an expected length that is, well, the lengths are one, two, three, and three is the last one in the list. And the average of those, since they're all equiprobable, give or take epsilon, is nine over four, which is two and a quarter bits. Is that the optimal symbol code? Can we do better? How? Anyone? No. Use C5. Use C5 and the expected length will be 2. Okay. QED. So, but the length of C5 x would be two. Right, so we can't just use that simple rule though, it's got the right spirit. We need to identify some sort of trade-off of when do you give short code words to the most probable guy, recognizing that there seems to be some sort of trade-off, that when we 
decide to not give them all length two words. If one of them gets a length one, then some others sort of get longer. It's a bit like when you've got a glove full of water, plastic glove full of water, and you squeeze a few of the fingers, and the other ones have to get bigger. There's some sort of conserved quantity lurking in there. And that cons conserved quantity is to do with unique decodability. If we allowed ourselves to shorten some of the words and didn't make the others longer, it looks like we lose uniquely, unique decodability. I've lost board as well. I've run out of board. Let's wipe this. I think the time has come for me to reveal how this rubber glove works, how the, the constraint of unique decodability works. So let's rattle through a way of thinking about this. If I only use code words of a particular length, how many of them can I have? Well, if all my code words have length, Two, um, L, two, then I can have four of them. If all my code words have length three, I can have eight. If all my code words have length one, I can only have zero and one, so I can have two. And in general, I can have two to the L of them. So there I was changing the size of the alphabet and noticing that if I have long words, I can have more of them, exponentially more of them. And here is the idea that wraps this up and is consistent with everything we've seen so far. The idea is you can think of each code word of some length L has a cost, let's call it, of 2 to the minus L. And what we're doing is going to the symbol coding supermarket. Here are the different aisles of the supermarket. You can go, you're making a symbol code, you can pick any code words you want. So here's the entire set of all conceivable code words, but you can't have any choice because it might not be uniquely decodable. And I've arranged them in aisles where each aisle has words of the same length. And you can wander through the supermarket, make some choices, and the size of the package for each code word is indicating how much it'll cost you. So you've got a budget of one, which is the entire height of the supermarket. You can buy these two code words if you want, the zero and the one, and then you're done. You can't add any more code words of any length because they'd be confused with the zero and the one. Or you can have these four. Or you can have these eight. Or we've seen a bunch of things you can also have. You could pick those four. That was code number one and you haven't exceeded your budget, and that's uniquely decodable. The fact that you haven't exceeded your budget doesn't guarantee that it's uniquely decodable, but uh, definitely if you go over your budget of one, then it won't be uniquely decodable. So what we've got is the following assertion. Let's write it here, having identified code one. If a code is uniquely decodable, then the cost of all the code words has to be less than your budget. Sum of 2 to the minus Li must be less than or equal to 1. These are the costs of your code words. That's your budget. OK, and this is called the Kraft inequality. And it's true. And we haven't proved it. I've just told you it. And the proof is in the book. So if you're interested in a, a proof, it's in the textbook. OK. So this is what unique decodability implies. You've got to stay within your budget. So there was code one, and we had some other ideas. Here was code number five. That was the selection that we made with code, where was it? Uh, two? Two. That's code two, which doesn't go over budget, but it didn't quite use up the whole budget. And so on noticed, we could make a change. Instead of buying the 001 code word right at the top, we could lop off the final one and buy the 000 next door instead. And that made the expected length shorter, which is good. And then we looked at this 
guy. Uh, that was my silly idea. Sorry about that. One, zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero. Okay. And that went over the budget. All right. And it was a great labor to find a proof that it, went, uh, that it didn't work. We had to think about strings. But now we've got the craft inequality. We could have known straight away. Oh, no point even trying this thing. It's violated the craft inequality, so it can't be uniquely decodable. All right. Um, in blue there, we have the optimal code. And here is um, C7, which I wiped off which is where we reversed all of them. So this is also uniquely decodable. And you can see the difference between the prefix code in blue, which is sort of sensible. It walks through the supermarket from one side to the other, buying code words that you won't confuse with each other. Whereas the silly um, back to front one, C6, uh, bought one, one, zero, and one, zero, zero, which are prefixes of each other, and they're on the same uh, Y coordinate in this, in this picture. All right. So that's the craft inequality. And a code that gets right up to the budget, that uses the full budget, we will call a complete code. A complete code is one that has sum of 2 to the minus Li equal to 1. If you haven't chosen yourself a complete code, the advice is you can probably go back to the supermarket, make some switches, and get yourself a shorter code. So it's a bit silly not to use a complete code. All right. And as we've observed, easy to decode codes are prefix codes. So. Let's now address the practical question, or no, the theoretical question. Theory first, practice next. Let's do five minutes on each. The theoretical question is, how well can we do with symbol codes? So if I give you any ensemble, x, and if you come up with the best symbol code by whatever method, how small can the expected length be? OK. So the definition of the expected length is sum over i, p, i, l, i. And we're now going to show that whatever you do with a symbol code, you can't beat the entropy. And we'll also identify what you need to do in order to get close to the entropy or all the way to the entropy. And it's all about figuring out what these expected lengths should be. And let me give us a clue. I'm going to define the ideal length for a code word to be log base 2, 1 over the probability of that code word. So I'm going to introduce a definition, namely the Shannon information content. So I say, let's assume the symbol code ought to be using those. I'm, I'm not assuming it. I'm, I'm just making a definition, and then we'll end up with a proof. OK, so that's, that's the ideal length. Now, if you rearrange this, and if you imagine that someone has picked some lengths li that may or may not be the ideal length, you can use those similarly to define some implicit probabilities for which those chosen lengths would be the ideal lengths. OK, so we've defined a relationship between lengths and probabilities in this way. And I'm going to call the implicit probabilities Q. And the implicit probability Q that you can get from whatever lengths you have come up with will be 2 to the minus Li, except you maybe didn't choose a complete code. So maybe the sum of all of these isn't 1, which would mean it's not a probability distribution. So I'm going to divide by the appropriate normalizing constant, z, where z is sum of 2 to the minus l i, which will be 1 if it is a complete code. So it's 1 if you've made a sensible uh, trip to the supermarket. 
but it could be smaller than one. So, note, Z will be less than or equal to one for any uniquely decodable code, and Z equals one for a complete code. Right. What does that then mean? Well, it means Li, the lengths that you've chosen, are log base 2, 1 over Qi minus log base 2, Z. And now I can plug this into L. So L is sum over I, Pi. We've got log base 2, 1 on Qi minus log base 2 of Z. Sorry, my board hygiene isn't very good today. Yep. Okay, wouldn't it be great if this said sum of P log 1 over P? So let's do that. Sum over I, P log base 2, 1 over P. Except that's not true anymore, so we need to uh, add on the appropriate thing so that it is true. Sum of P log P over Q, and then we still have minus log Z lurking at the end. Sum of PI is 1, so we can suck the log Z out of the summation. Right, we've got somewhere. If you pick any symbol code at all, then its expected length will equal the entropy plus something, plus something else. Let's give this a name. We'll call this the kullback leibler divergence between P and Q. And here's a little theorem. Sum of P log P over Q for any two distributions P and Q is greater than or equal to zero. This is called Gibbs inequality. And it's one of the most important inequalities of information theory. With equality only if Q is equal to P. And log Z, we already know, is less, sorry, Z is, all, is less than or equal to 1. So log Z is less than or equal to 0. And minus log Z is greater than or equal to 0 with equality only if the code is complete. So it's greater than or equal to 0 if the code is uniquely decodable with equality only if it's complete. So this is true for any code, for any symbol code. And so what we have just proved is that the expected length is greater than or equal to the entropy. Not only that, so we've shown that the best you can possibly do is the entropy. We've shown what you need to do in order to get to the entropy. You need your P to equal your Q. So you should be using implicit probabilities that are equal to the true probabilities. So your lengths should be the information contents. OK, so you get equality if and only if the lengths you're using are the Shannon information contents. And you've got a complete code, which will happen for free when you do that. OK, so what have we done? We've sort of proved a source coding theorem for symbol codes. We've shown that you should be using the Shannon information code contents to set your code word lengths if you want to get to the entropy. And then you will get to the entropy, and you can't get any further. OK, that was the theoretical bottom line for symbol codes. So the ideal code lengths are the Shannon information contents. But in practice, if I give you some probabilities, like the probabilities we had for English a moment ago, you take log base two of them, and you're not going to get an integer out, are you? So in practice, for any real probability distribution, you typically can't actually get exactly to the entropy. So there's a, a missing um, result, which is, well, how close can you get? 
And here's the answer to that. Let's start again on the left-hand side. And I'm not going to prove this, but it's in the textbook. If these ideal lengths, L, I, star, which are the channel information contents, are not integers, how close can you get? Answer, well, you can still always get within one bit of the entropy. So there exists an optimal symbol code for which this is true. So you can get within one bit, which sounds pretty good. Come back next week to hear whether this is good enough or whether, in fact, we still want to do better. The answer is going to be we want to do better because this isn't going to be good enough. All right. So that's theory. What about practice? Wouldn't it be great to be able to just take a probability distribution and work out an optimal symbol code for that probability distribution? Let me tell you how to do it. How to make optimal symbol codes. I'm not going to prove it. You can read the book to figure out a proof. The method for making optimal symbol codes that I will show you is called the Huffman algorithm. And it's very elegant. And it's not completely obvious why it should actually be optimal and why it should get you any near the optimal, the ideal Shannon information con content uh, code lengths. So here's a summary of how it works. Remember how a prefix code could be related to a binary tree. What we're going to do is build that binary tree starting from the leaves. We're going to start from the smallest, most remote leaves. So build a binary tree starting from the furthest leaves of the tree. And that's essentially the algorithm. Let, you sh let me show you what I mean. I'll show you with an example. That's usually the easiest way. Let me invent a probability distribution. OK, here is a six element probability vector. And here's the statement of the algorithm. Combine the two symbols with smallest probability into a new single symbol and repeat. That's the algorithm. OK, so we look at our list of probabilities and we say these are the two smallest, so we will combine them. And we've defined a little bit of a binary tree here. We combine them, we add up their probabilities, and we get 0 0.21. And now we repeat on the set of five probabilities that we have here. The two smallest ones are these two. We add them up, and we get 0 0.25. And now we look at these four probabilities. Plop, 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 plop. We find the two smallest, which are... 0.14 and 0.21. We combine them. And we get 0 0.35. OK. That was the first iteration. That was the second iteration. That was the third iteration. And then we've got 25 and 35, which are smaller than 40. So we combine them, we get 0 0.6 at the fourth step. And then we combine these, and we get 1, and we're done. And that was the fifth step. And now we've made a binary tree. 
And so we have made a prefix code because we can just slap labels 0, 1, 0, 1, any way you like, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And that defines your code words reading from the root back out to the leaves. Just as an example, 1, 0, 0. So the code word you'll give to this one is 1, 0, 0, and you can fill in the others. That's the Huffman algorithm, and it's optimal. Cool, hey? So, let me summarize what we've said. We've used Gibbs inequality. We've talked about unique decodability. We've introduced the idea of prefix codes and binary trees. And symbol codes are really all about building nice binary trees. Whenever you get a code that does achieve the entropy, the code lengths are equal to the information contents. That's the ideal code lengths. And with a symbol code, you can always get within one bit of the entropy. And you can do that with the Huffman algorithm. Here are the results we've stated without proof. The book has proofs of those results. I've got a few more slides just to keep things moving um, with some things you can be doing for next time. I also already encouraged you to do a project, namely invent a compressor and an uncompressor for a source file of 10,000 bits from a bent coin whose probability of one is 0.01 implement them and or estimate how well it works. And the screen has got some other recommended exercises and recommended reading. Thanks very much for coming. See you next week.